welcome to Peshad's People, in which I, Michael Peshad, meet the people making things happen in a region that's becoming ever more critical. We travel throughout the Asia Pacific and beyond to meet the most dynamic personalities film stars, actors, writers, and thinkers, leaders of business. They're all part of the program. This week I am in Thailand. Now, this area near Kaolak was absolutely devastated by the tsunami which hit Asia on Boxing Day in 2004. Thousands of people lost their lives just in the small villages within walking distance from here. The sheer scale of it all is still almost beyond our comprehension and for many the misery continues. But I've come to meet some people who are absolutely determined that the tsunami will not ruin any more young lives. Peter Baines was a forensic detective with the Australian police. He was sent to Thailand to identify tsunami victims. It changed his life forever. Rather than surveying the dead, he's now looking out for the living. He's built two orphanages already, Part of his campaign to show the world that help is still desperately needed here. If I walked out into the streets in Sydney today with a bucket in my hand and said I'm raising money for victims of the tsunami, people would say you're four and a half years too late. But part of the job that we have is advocating the needs of the children. Just because the, uh, it's been four and a half years, it doesn't mean their parents have come back and they, of course they never will. We spent two days at the Hands Across the Water orphanage near Kaolak. Peter first arrived a few days after the wave hit. As a forensic scientist, he was used to dealing with death. He'd been in Bali after the bombings there, for instance, but nothing prepared him for this. The natural reactions of the Thais when someone dies is to take the body to a temple. And uh, they took him to two temples um, at about five minutes' drive from where we stand today uh, at Wat Yan Yao and Wat uh, Bang Muan. And um, Wat Yan Yao is where most of the bodies were placed and um, there were sites there that I don't think people have ever seen before because there was three and a half thousand bodies laying on the ground of the temple in the most advanced state of decomposition that you can imagine. So you're going through these decomposed bodies looking at teeth and... That's right, we bring forensic odontologists, so dentists from around the world will come over and everyone... I, yeah, I, I, I know you're, the, 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 you, you've seen all that before, mm. but as you say, this was on a, on, on a different level. Was there yeah. a moment when it just struck you that this was something that was going to change your life as well? Having worked in this area and been surrounded by death for 20 odd years, I don't think I really appreciated the significance of it until, I guess, looking at the real um, impact on those that were left behind. Because for us to work as forensic practitioners, you have to look at the job as a job. You can't deal with every person as an individual. And I, and I don't mean that in a cruel way, I mean that as a coping way. Sure, sure. And I spent a number of days with, um, with some of the, f the relatives of people who had died and they were the hardest days I had. Emotionally, they were the hardest days to sit opposite um, someone who'd lost their, their daughter, who was here on, a, on her honeymoon with her husband, and um, they both died, and at the time she was pregnant. So this lady that I met, this Australian lady, lost her daughter, her son-in-law, and the only chance she ever had a grand, of grandchildren in, in that one day. And I spent the full day with her, and it was one of the most rewarding days, one of the hardest days. That, that we could have in this environment and there's a real balance for forensic practitioners there's a balance you can't have every second day at work like that but if you don't have them every now and again you forget the significance of why you're here and what you're doing the 60 or so children at the orphanage we visited were full of life and fun there is a wonderful warm family atmosphere which belies the background to their being there they deal with things like um, post-traumatic stress disorder. They deal with separation anxiety. They deal with survivor guilt. They deal with aquaphobia. Now, aquaphobia is a fear of the water. 
So for many of the kids who come to the beach, um, it's something that they have to overcome. You know, there's, a, there's children, there's a child at the orphanage who was with their, their grandfather on the day the tsunami happened. And the grandfather was running and had one grandchild in each hand. And the water caught up and knocked him over. And to survive for himself, he had to let go of one of the children. He let go and held onto a tree. And in doing so, he survived. And one of his grandchildren survived, the other didn't. So he deals with this um, anxiety around survivor guilt. And, and the, the, the professionals help him by saying, you know, he says, well, how did I make that decision? Why did it happen? They say, well, because you let go and you held on with your strongest hand. Now, the, 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 the child that survived deals with this separation anxiety. They lost their brother. So these stories, you know, and it is so, so very close to the surface for these children. And why would we think that just because it's four years they'd be over these things that will stay with them forever. Just because it's that time doesn't mean these things. You, you see how happy they are at, the, at, at yeah. the orphanage. You see they are beautiful, they are loved, they are filled with happiness. But they've all got their own incredible story to tell around their own personal loss. Do you talk about it? Do they talk about it? What's, what, how do you begin? You know, to make I, things better in that way. There's two children who, who live at the orphanage now and uh, names are Jing Jang and Kay Lum and they were aged three and one at the time of the tsunami and they were taken to a, an older man who was like a grandfather, um, took care of these children, took them to live in the jungle outside of, of Kowlak and they lived in a, a corrugated iron shed. Weren't part of a big village or anything and I've, I've been and seen it and but what happened, he lived there with them for a couple of years and he got sick and he got taken to hospital. But how that happened, we don't know because the, the two children, aged six and four at that stage, were left on their own. 21 days after he was admitted to hospital, these kids were found on the side of the road by the police. So they'd been left in, on their own in the yeah. jungle for 21 days. Now when they were found, they were, the police took them to, the lo, to, to our orphanage and said to Kunrat Jana, can you take them in? Yeah. You go, how do you say no? Even yeah. though you're full, you go, how do you say no? So, so Jing Jang, the little girl, for the first six weeks, did not speak a word of Thai to the Thai staff. She was so traumatised. Kay Lum, the little boy, ran away every day for four weeks. They had to go out and find him and bring him back. You see him up there today, and he's as happy as the rest of the kids. So they've all got a story. If people want to find out more, it's just through, through handsacrossthewater.com.au, which is our website and basically our platform for where we disseminate all the information and uh, write newsletters around what's happening with the kids and keep people updated as to you know, our wins and the constant challenges and things like that. All the day-to-day -day decisions at Hands Across the Water are made by Kuhn Rochana. The children are brought up to honour their Thai culture. Kuhn Rochana wanted me to understand why so many children were orphaned in this particular area. She took me to the village where most of the children used to live. Most of the people are fishing men and they live uh, next to the beach. And also tsunami is the first time in Thailand they didn't know before. So when the water go, uh, the, 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 before the wave come, the, all the water going down very far, you know, and the people see the fish, see many see, they, they go get fish. Oh, so they went and, because the water had gone yeah, out, yeah. the fish were there yeah, to and, be taken. Yeah. So the parents went out to get the fish. Yeah, and some they are on, on the fishing, on, on the, on the, on, on the uh, leaf in the sea. But the people who are stay, live in the sea, it's safe. If you're far enough out, yeah. you're okay. Yeah. But if you were, were close in... Yeah, you, you cannot, because very, very heavy. The way very heavy. They know here that the children can't rely on aid forever. Thus, they're searching out ways to make the orphanage economically self-sufficient. As another income source for the, for the, for the orphanage, they're about to release 20,000 uh, uh, fish 
end of the pond and as they grow then obviously it's a it's an opportunity for them to derive at the orphanage a food source then what sort of fish are they seller. yeah oh here they are yeah so yeah. these these will grow in this pond that you've you, right. you, you've dug out that's right and you'll eventually sell them in the local market that's exactly right yeah here we go this is it i think this is the historic footage After the break, more with the children of Kowlak and the legacy of the tsunami which won't ever go away. Welcome back. We're at the Hands Across the Water Orphanage in Thailand with Peter Baines. He's a former Australian policeman, now taking care of orphans of the Asian tsunami. While we were there, he was just establishing a rubber plantation to help provide the orphanage with a long-term source of income it will certainly need. When the tsunami happened, the popular perception, I think it's a true one, was that there was an enormous amount of aid. Yeah that came into this country and indeed all of these countries. Yeah. Why is there still a need? Mate, when I got involved in this, I never had any idea that we'd end up buying rubber plantations and fish farms and, and all of that. But what happened is there's a lot of money which is given in those early days because it's easy to raise money when the cause is front of mind. But yeah. what happens is just because, just because, you know, last year we had the floods in Burma, there was the earthquake in China, tragic events. That doesn't mean that because it's four years on, these kids no longer have needs. Their parents haven't come back and they never will. So for us, it's around providing them just with a, with a place to live is fantastic, but it's not enough. Mm. It's never going to be enough. And if we're serious about it, which we absolutely are, it's around being there for the long term. What about sort of the other organisations? As you say, there was loads of aid that yeah. came here. Yeah. Well, one of the things that happened and, and what it's led to is what I call the second wave of victims. There was 2,000 children in the Kowlak region who lost one or both parents. And what happened in those early days is there was, there was large NGOs and um, aid agencies from around the world who came into this area and said, we will, we will help. And one of their strategies was to say to the local Thai people who had survived, will you take these two children in and look after them, foster them, because they've lost their parents. Now the typical response from the Thais in this area was, well, I'd love to. I used to be a fisherman, my boat's been destroyed. Even if I had a new boat though, I used to sell my produce to the local hotel, it doesn't exist anymore. So their position was, well, we don't have an income to look after these children. So some of these aid agencies said, that's okay, we'll give you money to look after these children. Right. Okay. The families say, well, on that basis, yes, we'll take the children in. But after 12 months, the aid stopped, the money stopped, and without an adequate plan to prepare the families for, for the stopping of the aid, because the tourism still hasn't come back to Kowlak what it used to be. So what happened then, these families that had taken children in mm -hmm. were in a position where they could no longer afford to keep them because they weren't receiving this money as was promised. So there was children who were displaced from their homes once again, and for many of them, their second time in their short lives. Because, because organisations didn't commit and stay through to see long term. You must find it very frustrating. You saw all the aid come in, and then all the aid, well, stop. Well, I saw, I saw a lot of aid. Um, I heard the, you know, the unprecedented amount of money that, were, that was pledged and, and was donated. And um, what I know is the kids that we met in, um, in, in, in August 2005, the 30 kids who lived in a tent, they didn't receive any of that international aid. There was no aid that Those came from them. Those are your first children? Absolutely. The kids that we took in the tent in the first place, we've never received any, any assistance beyond what we've We've, we've um, gone out and done ourselves in building the first orphanage or the second orphanage. It wasn't money that came from other organisations. It wasn't money that was, came from the government. 
There are a lot of mouths to feed, three times each and every day. But he's managed to keep the funds coming in despite the global recession. In the past uh, three years, I've raised 1.5 million Australian dollars and we've never spent one cent on uh, administration of donors' money. So that's obviously a very attractive part for, for people to buy into. And uh, um, the, the biggest way they raise the money is I speak at, at conferences and um, uh, I'm booked to, to speak about leadership. And then I tell stories around how the work that we did here when I was working here in the tsunami, then the, the work that we've done and the lessons that we've learned out of building this. And I share those with organisations and, and that's all. I finish and then walk off stage. But this year I've spoken at two conferences and the CEO came up to me after one of them gave me a cheque for a quarter of a million dollars. I flew to Canada the next day and spoke at a conference and they gave me $300,000. After lunch, I met Nam. She was helping in the kitchen garden during the school holidays. Both her parents were killed in the tsunami. She went to live with her aunt, who was then killed in a road accident. After that, she was branded an unlucky child, and no one wanted her. I'm happy to say she's found a home here. We grow some vegetables. You're growing vegetables? Yes. yes okay. Do you like living here? Yes. You do? Why do you like it so much? Because uh, I'm happy when I see have many friends. I have many friends and I know have a mother and father and I now I have many many big many family. Friends. Big family. You do have yes. a big family and your English is very good. You've got your English is probably one of the best here, isn't it? <laughs> what are you hoping to do when when you grow up? Um, I want to grow an uh, organized tour. After the tsunami, there was apparently an outpouring of good intentions. Kun Rachana, who had begun gathering the children together after the tragedy, says she owes Peter Baines a debt she can never repay. He uh, wonderful. Wonderful man. <laughs> I respect him like my father, like my God, you know, that he will everything for us. The first he came when we are in the tent. You were in a tent? In a tent, no, no house, no. I stay with a kid in a tent. When you met Peter then, he then suddenly decided that he wanted to get you out of the tent and somewhere better, or? No, because um, in that time, many permission for many people. The first time I don't believe in Peter. Because many, many organizations come to me, oh, Rojina, I would like to help you to set up the orphanage. Oh, I'm really happy, you know. But uh, later, they did, I didn't, ne I never hear from, from those people again. So you got lots of promises. Yeah, but Peter, he came and he brought me many things. The first, he brought me uh, food and rice for the kids, many things. And after that, he really, 100%. So I'm really happy. When the, when the first building opened, oh, I'm crying. I'm so happy that, oh, he not just, he not just only uh, promised, but he did. He did for me. This is the memorial to the local victims of the tsunami. It's a measure of just how far the hands across the water children have come that they've begun playing in the sea again. <laughs> Hundreds of thousands in Asia lost their lives that day. Each victim and each survivor has their own story. Millions of lives were changed forever. The impact that that's going to have on many generations is extraordinary. And it's not until I didn't appreciate that until I became immersed in the work that we do now. I wasn't prepared to, to be something that I've criticised in other organisations and not staying long term. And part of it for me was, was committing long term and from that I know that we can do so much more if we stay and make such a big difference and the opportunities are there to go into different countries. I've been asked to go into a number of different countries now to do what we've created here. And um, a as an organisation there's a lot of, um, we need to have a very clear um, a clarity of purpose around what we're about and not just because there's an opportunity to go elsewhere to, to take it for the sake of growing. And I think um, part of what we look at is 
Could we provide care to a thousand children? Yes, we could. But would that level of care be different than if we focus on the hundred children that live here permanently, thereabouts? And it would be very different. And we know that by focusing on the children that we've got here right now, it's the opportunity to help them become leaders of their community. Obviously you don't do it for the rewards to you, but I'm just trying to get an idea of, of what it's meant for you. It's, it's, the, it's the, without question, it gives me goosebumps when I think about it, it is the most rewarding thing I've ever done in my life. And uh, to, to stand here and look at the two physical premises, it, it blows me away. To see these children run through here in, in the happiness that they have, how can you not stand back and go, this is good? Seeing the kids around, the Thai children, how happy they are, how healthy they are, and you know the beautiful staff, you know, it's, it's, it's priceless, absolutely priceless. Peter, it is priceless. It's been an absolutely pleasure Thank meeting you, Michael. You. And well done. Wish you all the sport in the world. Thank, Thank you. you, mate. Thanks Thank for being on the programme. Thank you. Next week, what life is really like on the professional golf circuit. Meet Singapore's most successful ever golfer in major championships. Lam Chi Bing, he's with me next week. Oh,